Welcome to the 1920s Culture and Women Lecture. We're going to examine a major court case of the time period. Who are flappers? What are they about? And then media and music of the time. Uh, we're going to start with the Scopes Trial. All right. What the Scopes Trial is, is a group of people were looking to challenge a Tennessee law that um, for forbidden public of public schools from teaching evolution, all right? So they run this ad in this paper, and John Scopes is going to answer that, all right? He's a science teacher, all right? Um, in 1925, Tennessee is going to pass a law making it a crime to teach evolution uh, in public schools. And evolution is this theory that uh, human beings evolved from small apes or monkeys, all right, and eventually through time, we went from being on four legs to standing erect just as you and I are now. All right, it's just a theory because science can't technically prove it with straightforward uh, evidence, but there's enough evidence to lead them to believe this is what happened. All right, it actually goes against um, Christian beliefs that God created uh, man, all right, and so... Tennessee being a very religious state makes it a law against teaching evolution in public schools. But however, John Scopes, he teaches it again, or teaches it anyway. Clarence Darrow is going to uh, represent Scopes in the trial. He is the most famous uh, trial lawyer of the day. He's kind of like uh, Johnny Cochran to um, O.J. Simpson. All right? And then you have uh, fundamentalist Williams Jenny Bryant. Jennings Bryan, right? He's a special prosecutor. He takes the Bible literally, all right? That's what a fundamentalist is, is they take the Bible literally. Whatever is written exactly happened, and they are all for whatever is written, and they take it very literally. They do not stray away from it whatsoever, all right? And so to Brian, this fact that God created man all right, and then the teaching of evolution goes exactly against that religion. And so he's going to say, no, this law is written for a reason, and it's been broken, and Scopes is guilty. All right, what the trial actually does is it debates evolution. Is it a theory? Can it kind of be proven? Is it what's the science behind it? Is it educational? All right, and they also uh, examines the role of science and religion in school, Okay, um, what can science teach? How should it be taught, all right? And then religion, at what point is religion allowed into our schools? Because our Constitution actually has it written in that no one law or one religion um, is the head religion of the United States. <clears throat> and so, then that's called the Establishment Clause. So we're not, we don't establish one religion as the religion of the United States, and therefore if I force you to believe or don't give you a chance to think outside of Christianity and the fact that God created man or the belief that God created man, then I go against that establishment clause. What ends up happening in the end is Brian admits uh, the Bible's open to interpretation Okay, he's like, yeah, okay, maybe not things aren't taken quite so literally. Maybe some things can be interpreted differently. All right, but in the end, Scopes is actually found guilty. He's fined $100, okay? Um, except for that's all paid for him. Uh, the group that put it up were willing to go and take it that far, and if he is found guilty, the, uh, the pay is fined for him. But it becomes this real big national attention. A lot of people go to the trial. You can see this anti-evolution league. All right, these people um, going against the conflict, hell in the high school. All right, um, it became this really big natural attraction as to what should be taught in our schools, as to how man was created, how did we get on this earth. Let's meet some flappers. All right, what's a flapper? Well, she's an emancipated young woman who adopts new fashions and attitudes. All right, emancipated meaning kind of like liberated. This girl who's going to take her future on herself. She's not going to go to the cultural norms of you're supposed to be this housewife who takes care of kids and keeps the house clean and looks very modest, dressed from head to toe in clothing so that as to not send off the wrong message. All right, 
um, many young women, they want the equal status as men, so they're going to become assertive. They're going to take control of their lives and take control of what they believe in and how they feel that they should be, not being told what they should be. Okay? And middle class men and women, they actually begin to see marriage as this equal partnership that women have as much of a say as men do. All right, before then it was women listened to the men. All right, the man was totally in control and she was totally submissive to him. But now they start to see it as this kind of equal partnership that women aren't lower than men on the totem pole. All right, so you can see what a flapper is here. Uh, their fashion were these like skirts that came to their knees and that was huge all right before they used to wear dresses all the way down to their feet you don't show an ankle an ankle used to be sexy because you never saw a woman's leg unless it was your wife okay also they cut their hair all right they bobbed it that's what we call a bob they cut it to the ears okay um and they often wore these hats and you can see the attitude of the flapper these girls are dancing on a rooftop all right, look below. They are on the edge. Not only are they dancing on a rooftop, they are wearing heels. Risky women, liberated, taking control of their future or their death. All right, you can also see here's another example. Uh, skirts to the knees, wearing heels, showing the leg, short hair. All right, the elders disapprove of this new behavior. Think about how you act and how your grandparents think of what you do, all right? That's always common all the way through history. Our elders always disapprove of this new behavior or these new things that we do, all right? Women actually begin to casually date men, all right? And that replaces formal courtship where a man would ask you on a date and see you through. And if things worked out, you would get married. But if it didn't work out, well, back to the drawing board. No, women start to like casually date, like, yeah, after two days, it's not going to work out onto the next man real quickly, All right? Before that, if you move from man to man to man, you are looked as a hussy, okay? You guys have a different word for it today, and I bet you can think it right now. Um, however, this was really, really looked down upon that women don't casually date, like, oh, I was seeing this guy, didn't work out, so now I'm on the Johnny, or dating multiple men at the same time highly looked down upon all right um and then women are subjected to a what we call a double standard all right a double standard is where we allow one gender to do it but not the other all right and what that meant is women had less sexual freedom than men um they must observe stricter standards of behavior think about it it still stands today if a man has uh relations with uh, more than one woman, all right, say he's got three women, he's got his main and then his two sides, uh, he's looked at as a player, or a man's man, right? He's got it all going on. Um, but if a woman does it, ooh, she's all sorts of names. She's dirty. She's this. You want to stay away from her, right? Well, that, that kind of existed back then, too. As women started the date more and more, they weren't supposed to be as sexually active as men. All right, men could do it, and that was fine. But if a woman did it, did it, whoo, she's very, very bad. All right, the media, radio comes of age. All right, it's the most powerful communication medium of the 1920s. All right, you got your national news and experiences. You could actually start to hear news as it happened. The only way of getting news was from the newspaper before then. And this is huge, all right? We didn't have the internet where we can go look things up immediately. We didn't have television where they can show you something that's ha happening in Istanbul right now, okay? But the radio could do that, but only nationwide, all right? So if something's happening in Washington, D.C., they could listen in and hear it. And this becomes huge because if you didn't want to read about it in tomorrow's newspaper, which would make it old news, you would buy a radio so you could listen to it right now. Right, we have this newfound leisure time. All right, people have extra money, all right, and extra time to enjoy the money. And so what they start to do is start going to sporting events. You start having large crowds at baseball games, all right? Baseball becomes huge, and the games are broadcasted over the radio, or boxing matches become huge, and play-by-play -play over the radio, all right? And then we start to have this glorification of 
athletes by the mass media for the first time. Think about it today. You can't even watch SportsCenter without not hearing LeBron James' name. Okay? Um, but it started back then. You start to glorify uh, men and women who are star athletes of their time. Now, <coughs> excuse me. Then we meet this man, Charles Lindbergh, okay? Lindbergh's going to make the first solo nonstop flight across the Atlantic. And that's huge because nobody had done it all by themselves before. All right? And he's, he comes from a small town in Minnesota. Everybody kind of knows everybody in uh, small towns. Um, there's really no secrets. So his solo nonstop flight across the Atlantic is a sign of honesty. And then because of the fact he did it by himself is a sign of bravery. And so you can just meet some of the uh, men and women of the time. We have Bill Tilden. Uh, Babe Ruth, huge baseball player, Bobby Jones, uh, legendary golfer, Jack Dempsey, heavyweight boxer, all right, and then Gertrude Ederl, or Elderl, Harlem Renaissance, okay, uh, we have the Great Migration started during the World War I era, 1910 to 1920, okay, we call it the Great Migration, it's the thousands of African Americans moving from the south to the north, okay? By 1920, over 40% of African Americans in the United States live in cities. So when they move from the south to the north, they're mostly living in cities, right? And they continue to migrate in, the lar in large numbers into the 1920s. And something happens as you have a large group of African Americans living in one area, uh, what becomes known as the Harlem Renaissance, all right? Harlem, even today, uh, made up of many African Americans, all right? True back then, too. What the Harlem Renaissance is, is this literary and artistic movement by African Americans, okay? They start to express pride in African American experiences, all right? Take Claude McKay's poems, for example. He urged blacks to resist prejudice and discrimination. And this is huge because African Americans didn't do this. All right? They didn't speak out against the uh, social norms that were wrong of that time period. All right? And then you have Langston Hughes' poems that describe the difficult lives of working classes. For the first time, whites start to see exactly how bad African Americans of the time have it with all the prejudice and the discrimination against them. And then they get to take a look into their lives of working class African Americans and realize that they're no different from us, and they start to pay attention to that. All right? And then you have African-American jazz. Jazz is awesome. The 1920s jazz is fantastic. Okay, it's going to originate in New Orleans and spread across the United States. Each area kind of have it, has its different vibe and its different sound, but it's just wonderful. Because jazz back then wasn't like we know music today where you get this music sheet and everybody's looking at their music sheet and playing the notes and the keys accordingly to what the sheet says. No. Jazz back then, you'd have like eight guys up on the stage. And then first, you'd maybe have like the bassist joining in. And then maybe you'd have the drummer start tapping a beat to that. And then the trumpeter would join in. And then the saxophonist. And then the pianist. All right. And then the guy with the guitar. All right. You'd have all these guys with different instruments joining in. Nothing written down, but making wonderful, wonderful music. And it's amazing that you don't even have to have music in front of you, but you can create something so beautiful and so elegant. All right. uh, trumpeter Louis Armstrong uh, makes personal expressions a key part of jazz. All right, brings his own personal experiences and expressions out in his jazz. And he actually becomes the most influential musician in jazz history. Uh, very, very popular today. I'm a fan of his as well. All right, and then you have Edward Kennedy or Duke Ellington. All right, he's a jazz pianist and an orchestra leader. Huge in 1920s jazz. All right, uh, You'll hear a lot about the Duke or Duke Ellington in his jazz. All right, he's one of America's greatest composers of jazz. And then you have Bessie Smith. Uh, blue singer, perhaps uh, best vocalist of the 1920s, adding in her vocals, all right? And so jazz, as we're going to hear some in class, 1920s jazz, uh, very elegant, very awesome. And then you would have uh, clubs like the Cotton Club, all African-American club, okay, where 
uh, jazz was being played, okay? This was actually Duke Ellington's club, and African Americans would come here and enjoy this great music.